Hi everyone, this is Casper Eastman again. I'd like to talk a little bit today about my experience living abroad. For those of you who are not aware or who haven't seen my previous video dealing with the subject of Russian wives, I'm a U.S. citizen who's been living and working in the Russian Federation for almost 10 years. And combined with some time in another former Soviet Republic, I've been living in this part of the world for almost 11 years. And I think the thing I want to discuss today is how, at least for me, living abroad, especially living in a place that has not been in, influenced by, I would even say infiltrated, by third wave feminism and political correctness nearly to the degree it has in the West, has been very, very important for my personal development. I don't know that I want to necessarily say or encourage men to try to go live abroad. Obviously, packing up your stuff and going to another country, learning another language, all those sorts of things, uh, it's very difficult, it's not easy, and it's not for everyone. And I've had my share of adventures uh, with the experience that I've had. But I think now that I'm at a point where I'm considering going back to my home country, which is the United States, I'm beginning to sort of reflect over the last... 10 years I've been living here, and I'd like to sort of share my experiences with other people, especially men, uh, regarding how at least my experience living here has been a very positive experience, especially in regards to how it has in many ways deprogrammed me from the blatant gynocentrism and, well, hyperfeminism that has influenced our society. I think the first time I ever sort of understood to what degree political correctness and hyperfeminism hyper influences our country, it was my first, I'd have to say my first month in Moscow. And this is, I had lived in a former Soviet Republic for some time before that, but I came here for work in 2007. And starting out, I, I, I had a lot of free time on my hands. It, it, took, it took me about three months to get really established here. So one day, I was watching uh, a television show. I was standing in my kitchen at the time, ironing my clothes. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I was watching a talk show very similar to something like the Oprah Winfrey show. And... The subject on that particular day was, could a woman be the president of the Russian Federation? As is often the case on American talk shows, there was a panel of various people. Of course, in Russia, anytime there are discussions like this, there's a tendency to use poets, literary figures, etc. And, and this on this particular day, a bard, a poet and a bard, uh, Historically, these sorts of these sorts of people have had a big influence on Russian society. They've always been a very important sort of force within the intelligentsia, and it's always been that way. If you know anything about Russian history, so the question was first posed, posed to this particular bard who was, you know, sort of performing his songs, and in between they discussed this this question, this topic, and he was very diplomatic in how he answered it. He at first said that he thought that it was possible that there certainly probably is or are women in the country that could fill that role. But he didn't out and right come out and say that a woman couldn't do it. Then the question was given to the audience and the host was a woman and judging by what I could see uh, probably about 85% 80 to 85 percent, I would say, of the audience were women, and the age range was between the early, the early 30s up until pensioner age, so say 60s, which of course, if you, I mean, watch the average daytime talk show in the United States, if you see the audience, it generally largely consists of women, probably within the same age group. It seems like there's something to female nature that's connected with this kind of interaction and these kind of shows, but that's a, probably a subject for a different video. So 
the woman opens up, the host opens up the question to the audience. And, you know, people in the audience begin to eagerly raise their hands. And the first person the host walks up to is a woman who at the time, she was probably in her early 30s. I would have given her, you know, she was about the age of 32, 33. She asks the question, restates, do you think a woman could be the president of the Russian Federation? Here's what she said. If you translate what she said word for word, her answer was basically this. Yes, I think it's possible that a woman could be the president of the Russian Federation. But politics is dirty business. That's a man's job. A woman should be at home with her children taking care of the house. Now, having grown up in the West and having had my fair share of well, exposure to the Oprah Winfrey show, the You Go Girl, I mean, I think the whole You Go Girl mentality in many ways kind of started with her. Uh, I expected the audience response to be obviously negative. I was expecting sneers, boos, etc. But to my shock, the response was the opposite. There was rapturous applause. And I guess that you could say at that moment, I knew that I wasn't in Kansas anymore. Now, one of the reasons why I decided to make this video today is because I had a very similar experience yesterday. I was talking with a woman who is in her late 30s, and as we were chatting, we got on the subject of women in the workplace, especially in a sort of educational context, so in other words, at schools and all these sorts of things. And I just mentioned in passing that I have a friend who recently had to leave a company where he was working, a school, a language school. And the reason why he had to leave was because of the drama, tension, infighting going, among, going on among the management and the rest of the employees. And I mentioned in passing that a great percentage, most of the management at this particular company consisted of women. The owner-operator is a man. He was He's a guy that finances it. But everyone running the show, doing, doing sort of the work, keeping the school going, they're all women. And when I said that, this particular woman that I was having a conversation with said, well, that's no surprise. And then she proceeded to say that when you put women in an environment, where they're running things and there's no male presence, there tends to be a lot of drama and tension. And again, after being here for so long, I, I expect to hear those sorts of things, but I still, I guess you can say, having grown up in the U.S., where you can't say those sorts of things without some kind of social consequences, or, I mean, hell, you could even lose your job at this point for saying something like that publicly, especially if you're a man, and especially if you're a white man. But here you can say it. You can say sorts of those sorts of things. And quite frankly, more often than not, you can hear women say these sorts of things about other women. It's absolutely amazing. Now, I don't say this to sort of idealize uh, Russia. There clearly are a lot of problems here. Uh, there are a lot of political issues, political problems. I think this country is still reeling from the 74 years of uh, Soviet communism, and it's going to take probably another generation to sort of weed all the bad stuff that came from those years under Soviet communism completely out of the society. Nevertheless, I can say that probably one of the things that I've got, the, the most, one of the most enriching things I've experienced here is this living in a place where you don't have to walk on eggshells when you speak, and you can speak your mind about a lot of things. And being in an environment like that has really sensitized me to how much political correctness, in many ways, has ruined our society. In the West, I'm talking about the United States, I'm talking about Britain, places like that. Places that are supposedly champions and beacons of freedom, democracy, freedom of speech. And it sensitized me to that to such an extent that I'll be quite 
honest, I, I'm going to have a hard time going home. Because I've come to a point now where when I come against a run, run into this kind of garbage, this, this kind of this hypersensitive political correctness, I would call it feminazism. I can't keep my mouth shut anymore. And I had a, I've had an experience. In fact, I had an experience last year. This was one of the, one of the things that played a very big role in my, I guess you can say, taking the red pill, where I took a course in Budapest, Hungary. I went and lived there for five weeks, took a course. And most of the people I was doing the course with were Western, primarily Western women. So there were quite a few of them, obviously, from Budapest and Hungary. But uh, a, a very large percentage of the group were uh, British British females. And there was a situation where we were having a discussion about shopping. And it's hard for me to go into all the details in the background without giving away too much information about myself. Uh, but basically, I sort of said in passing that women within a certain age group are more inclined to like shopping, and especially in the areas of the former Soviet Union and the former Eastern Bloc. Just this part of the world is more traditional. And in addition to that, if you know anything about what went on behind the Iron Curtain before uh, the wall came down in 1989, uh, this part of the world, because of the inefficiencies of the central planning and the economy, there were always large amounts of uh, rationing, shortages of consumer goods. And when the wall opened up and the markets here became liberalized, obviously it created a whole new wave of sort of consumerism here. And all of that consumerism that, you know, and I, again, I think it's, there have been, there's statistics that show that by and large, a lot, a large percentage of consumerism consumption is, is, is done by women. I mean, this is even true in the West. Well, you can imagine what it would be, what it would be like in a place where all of that consumerism was sort of, uh, had a, I guess you can say a sort of shoved in a bottle and had a cap put on it and was bottled up for 74, four years. When that was unleashed, women, you know, went out, bought stuff, bought a lot of clothes, got into all those sorts of things that you know they weren't able really ever to sort of indulge in during this during the Soviet period, during the communist period. Well, going back to my story, I made the statement, and I would all the things that I said. What I said assumed that the people in the room understood the context that I was saying it in, because there's no doubt that. Uh, this part of the world is more traditional, and because of the situation with the shortages during uh, central planning, when this part of the world opened up and the markets were liberalized, you know, women really started hitting the shops, going shopping, buying dresses, buying clothes, buying purses, and there's still a lot of that over here. I think a lot of people that came from that sort of generation are still sort of in a at a point where they they haven't fully come to realize sort of psychologically what it, that they have access to all this stuff at any time because they went most of their lives uh, without having access to those sorts of things. It's sort of like my grandmother. I have a grandmother who almost has a, a I guess you could call it a psychological, it's like a tick almost. She grew up in the Great Depression and grew up in a part of the state where I'm from that was very, very heavily affected by the Great Depression. And to this day, she's in her 80s now. When there's a sell at the store for uh, especially food or any kind of toiletries or anything like that, she goes and buys it all up and stocks it all up. And I think it, it it's largely due to the fact that she's still experiencing psychological trauma from the Great Depression. And in the same way, I think a lot of people here who are over the age of 35 or 40, especially women, are still sort of experiencing this uh, not having access to consumer goods. 
So I, I, made, I made this statement, and two of the British girls that were in the room with me flipped out and started resorting to the typical sort of MO of uh, feminists, especially in a very politically, you know, sort of correct context of using a bunch of shaming language. And, you know, having been where I've been living now for the last 10 years, where there virtually is no political correctness, especially when it comes to these sorts of social issues and talking about gender roles and all those sorts of things, instead of sort of falling in line and keeping my mouth shut, I blew up. And I turned the shaming language on to them. And they did not expect it. And for the rest of the time that I did that course, I isolated them. I, it's not that I isolated them, but I refused to have anything to do with them, except only in the situations where it pertained to sort of doing our coursework, because I was so disgusted and appalled by, one, the total irrationality of their reaction to what I had said, especially in a lot of the, the context we were sitting in, and just the absurdity of, 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 of Feminism and modern-day political correctness. I mean, you understand theoretically that it's a bunch of nonsense, but it's one of those sorts of things where until you're sort of, you come against it and it's sort of aimed at you, you, I don't know, I guess you just never really understand how much, how pervasive it is in our society. I guess you can say the moral of the story, if there is a moral to this story, I guess I'm kind of ranting, but I really do think that, um, some of you guys might benefit from this information. If you ever have an opportunity to go, guys, and I'm, you, it doesn't really matter what your age is, but for you guys who are a little younger, sort of like I was when I decided to leave the U.S. and experience the world, uh, if you've got a few years you want to go and sort of experience the world, you might ought to consider trying to get out of the western part of the world I mean, obviously, leaving your home country, going to a part of the world that's a little less developed is, is not easy, and there's a lot of difficulties that come with it, a lot of hardships, a lot of, a lot of, just a lot of things that make it a difficult experience. But if you want to be in an environment where you're not surrounded for some period of time by the garbage that is political correctness, third-wave feminism, and all those sorts of things, uh, it really is a good way of sort of deprogramming yourself from that. You take yourself out of that context. You go into an environment where that doesn't exist. And I think it can be a very enriching sort of experience for a young man, especially in light of the fact that, I mean, I'm a little older. I'm moving into my late 30s now, and all the stuff in the schools with all the political correctness and the uh, blatant gynocentric type of stuff and the whole changing the, the, the method of delivering education to favor young girls with all the busy work. And I mean, there have been videos, there are videos out there that, that uh, talk about this and there are articles out there that document this, uh, even in uh, sources that are not, uh, how should I say, hostile to feminism, like for example, The Atlantic. You know, I, I was in a, I was in school when that was really first starting to infiltrate the school system, and I guess you can say I kind of caught the old style of receiving a, 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 a public school education. And only the last few years I was in school did I really, in retrospect, really start seeing some of these tendencies that are so pervasive now. And of course, we see with this millennial generation and how they're especially the men, man, I, I watch this from, from, from abroad, from the outside, and it just seems that our young men have been totally emasculated. Totally emasculated. I shudder at the thought of what it's going to be like in 10, 15 years if something doesn't change. But if you have the opportunity, you young guys who are beginning to understand how much you have been influenced by all this and you you didn't understand it you're only now 
uh, through the manosphere, beginning to sort of kind of understand what's going on. You're sort of reflecting on your life and looking within yourself, and you, you see how much it's influenced you personally. If you if you have the opportunity and you have uh, sort of a sense of adventure, you might want to consider going to a place like where I am for some period of time. You probably shouldn't go away for as long as I have. But hey, you know, I, I have a sort of a strong affinity for this part of the world in general. I, I find the language here interesting and the culture and the history, despite all the problems and despite all the dark pages in the history of this area, quite frankly. Uh, nevertheless, if you can get away for a couple of years to get yourself out of that environment so that you can live in a place where you don't have to put up with all of that and sort of deprogram and become more sensitive to how much it influences you subconsciously just because it's so prevalent in our society so that when you can go back, you can call a spade a spade and call people out on this kind of stuff when they try to use shaming language and all those methods that are so common among, especially again, among feminists and gynocentric types, I guess. Uh, if you can do it, I'd highly encourage it. Another thing I think in regards to the story that I just told, and it's, I think when I return, I'm going to do this because I found it to be very effective. I told you about the story in Budapest. And, you know, a common tactic among these social justice warriors, feminists types, is to use shaming language whenever you say something that's politically, politically incorrect. I found that by not following in line and by reacting very sharply and calling them out publicly for doing this, it almost had the opposite effect, especially if one of those girls... She began to experience shame. It was almost like a reverse shaming, I guess you can say. Of course, I, I, I used a lot of you know, rational arguments. Now, keep in mind, this is before I really took the red pill. I was sort of, I'd already started thinking about the influence of political correctness on our society. But I can't say that I'd really thought about uh, female nature and those sorts of things. Um. But I, I think this is uh, something that you guys, if you're back home and uh, you run into a situation like this, and you most certainly will because you can't speak your mind without someone reacting negatively now, it seems to me, in the U.S. and in Britain. I would encourage you to do it. Well, that's all i got to say. If you've got any questions uh, or want to leave a comment, feel, please feel free to do so. Uh, thank you for listening. Talk to you soon.